Just a quick note about this episode. As I was listening to the recording, I realized we didn't emphasize enough our guest's involvement in his whistleblower case against Lockheed Martin. And the reason this is so important is to establish credibility. Michael DeCourt literally blew the cover off a 25-year, $24 billion Coast Guard project replete with problems that jeopardized the safety of countless lives. Investigations were conducted by the Department of Homeland Security, the U.S. Congress, the U.S. Department of Justice, and various members of the press. Their findings all validated Michael's concerns. And in 2012, the project was discontinued. Michael was forced out of Lockheed Martin and has been unable to find work in the defense industry ever since. He's paid an enormous price, placing public safety and national security over his own career. So as you're listening to this interview wondering, why should I care what Michael DeCourt has to say about autonomous vehicles? Well, you should, because he's done this before. Enjoy the episode. This episode of the Driving Safety Show is sponsored by Drivers Alert celebrating 30 years of helping companies keep their drivers safe. To learn more, visit driversalert.com. Distracted driving, drunk driving, drowsy driving. You want safer roads, and so do we. You're listening to The Driving Safety Show. Hear insights, in-depth analysis, and expert advice from key players in the private, public, and nonprofit sectors who are leading the way in making our roads safer. Are you ready to join us? And now, your host of The Driving Safety Show, Rich Sordahl. Welcome to another episode of The Driving Safety Show. It's episode number 20. Today's guest is not afraid to speak up when it comes to safety. On August 3rd, 2006, he made national news by becoming the first person ever to use YouTube as a whistleblowing tool, posting a 10-minute video alleging serious flaws in his former employer's involvement in upgrading the security on U.S. Coast Guard vessels, calling the contract a waste of tax dollars that jeopardized the safety of Americans. His former employer, Lockheed Martin, laid him off shortly thereafter. His whistleblowing resulted in him serving as a lead witness before a U.S. congressional hearing. He's appeared on 60 Minutes and been featured in the documentary War on Whistleblowers. He's also been written about in several books, including Rescue Warriors, Complex Contracting, and A Blogger's Manifesto. Most recently, he's been vocal about the development of the autonomous vehicle, claiming if we continue down the path of real-world testing, thousands of lives will be lost. It is with great pleasure that I welcome Michael DeCourt to the program. Michael, thanks for being on the show. I'm well, glad to be here. Appreciate the opportunity. Before we get into the, the issue of autonomous vehicles, I think you know, it's, it's important to delve into your background a little bit just so people understand, okay, you know, why, why is you know, Michael so vocal about the autonomous vehicle uh, situation and you know, why is that opinion important? So I think it's kind of important to, to look in and into some of the things that you've done in your history. So in 2006, at the time you posted that YouTube video, what was your role at Lockheed? Uh, at the time, I was the software engineering manager for uh, NORAD. And and the program that 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 was involved in was Deep Water, which is the it was like a twenty five year program to basically upgrade the Coast Guard's con, uh, their whole fleet and all their equipment, right? Yes, it was a it was a project that was actually on on the books to be accomplished before that, but because of nine eleven, they accelerated it. And and this was um, so this was part of a joint venture. I think Northrop Grumman was also involved in the in the project. Yes, Northrop Grumman and Lockheed created a joint venture called uh, uh, Integrated Coast Guard Systems. And and so you at, at the time you were so you were involved in in the um, in this project, and you had voiced your concerns about some things that you saw that that seemed to be you know overlooked or neglected or yeah. You know, do, do you feel like that there was just some just gross negligence and some people basically were uh, unqualified to do the job? And so you were trying to raise uh, attention and raise that flag to, to supervisors. Yes, sir. It, it, it was, uh, I was the lead system engineer on the first major project. It was to upgrade these 49 boats that were 110 feet long, and we were going to create 123-foot boats. Uh, and they were made longer so you could put a Zodiac boat in the back. But then we were also upgrading all the communications and, sen and, and navigation and sensor systems. And because the program was a system-of-systems system project where if you – 
if somebody designed one system in a certain way, you had an obligation to reuse it on other platforms. That sounds like it's common sense, but a lot of times in DOD and other places, for each platform or aircraft or ship, they'll have a different contract, so things don't exactly get coordinated. But because this was a massive upgrade, they wanted to coordinate things. Um, and, and because we were the, the first ship to do these, these systems, C4ISR, it's command control, computers, communications, intelligence, surveillance, surveillance and reconnaissance. Um, whatever we decided we would do, everybody else would have to leverage unless they had a, a good reason not to, and they, they would have to get permission to deviate. So then what ensued, I guess, as a result of this, you were lead witness in a congressional hearing. Um, you know, you made national news, you're in a documentary, I believe, and then uh, several books that you've been, you've been mentioned. Um, so you obviously have an incredible amount of experience in just taking on uh, the establishment, getting out, I guess, this group think, uh, if, if you will. Uh, what, what about other notable items that I left out of your bio? So you're a, you're a member of the Society of Automotive Engineers, and you're actually part of a task force related to autonomous vehicles, correct? Uh, yes, sir. I'm actually uh, on two different task forces. One of them is uh, the VNV or Validation and Verification Task Force. We're testing for autonomous vehicles. I'm a member of that, but I am uh, the lead right now of a brand new task force for modeling and simulation for them. Okay. And again, it was just so many things like project manager, systems engineer, aerospace flight simulation, software engineering manager, and senior program manager for, for NORAD. Were you, were you actually there in uh, yeah. Cheyenne Mountain? Yes, I, I, uh, I've been inside the mountain several wow. times. Yes. And then even software project manager for the Aegis Weapon System. And then, you know, to today, what you're doing, you're the founder and, and uh, chief technology officer at Dactyl. So what, what does Dactyl do? Dactyl uh, is a company uh, that's pulling together a couple partners uh, across simulation and in the simulator world, especially in Air Force and DOD, to provide literally everything that an autonomous vehicle maker would need to uh, switch away from the vast majority of the public shadow and safety they're dri driving they're doing. So in order to do that, you would have to replace the vehicle, you would uh, have to replace the world, the sensors, uh, other objects with with proper simulation, and that's the key. So, it, and, and as well as that, you have to run scenarios. So you need data. Right now, uh, the way it's happening is these companies are going out to this a la carte, looking for tools, and getting the tools, hoping that they have they work right, and then integrating them. And they have to go now go find the data. So we literally want to provide all of the scenarios with all of the data, with all the simulations at the proper fidelity level to help these autonomous vehicle makers get to a legitimate level four, because currently using public shadow and safety driving, it's literally impossible to do that. And so the, your, your position then to, to get there, where they're trying to go with autonomous vehicles, to get there faster and of course save lives, you really, the simulation is the way to go and not doing real world testing with the public. Yes, there's two, there's two issues that, uh, that folks have to, um, I guess, be, be, become aware of or be, get acclimated to at some point because they have no choice. Um, but uh, public shadow and safety driving, uh, the problem there is the amount of miles you would have to drive and the time and money you would have to spend. Uh, it's just not remotely possible to do. Uh, RAND Technologies did a study and said, well, if you're going to drive and redrive or stumble and restumble on enough scenarios to do this, it would be the equivalent of, of, of 11 billion miles to be 20% better than a person. If you extrapolate that out to 10 times better than a person, it's 500 billion miles. Toyota said a trillion. So now I have a trillion miles. I did some uh, really conservative math on what it would cost you to do that with vehicles and sensors and drivers and not even any, any engineering costs. And, and it came up to $300 billion for 10 years, over 10 years. So you can't spend the time and you can't, you can't uh, spend the money. So then the other issue is safety. There are two safety issues that cannot be properly resolved. One of them is handover. Even though you can train people and use monitoring and alarm systems that watch your eyes, et cetera, uh, and that's helpful, there's a period of time in, in complex scenarios or time critical scenarios uh, where you cannot provide the human enough time to regain enough situational awareness to do the right thing the right way. And most of these are accident scenarios. And then the worst one of all, the most egregious one, is the one where you know machine learning works by um, experience, experiencing scenarios. And so it has to experience them and then re-experience them over and over and over again uh, so that you can uh, basically tweak the network so that you can drive the error rate down. Well, think about accident scenarios. We need these vehicles to learn how to avoid these accident scenarios or to handle them the best possible if they can't avoid them. Well, what does that mean? That means that the safety driver literally 
has to not disengage, not take over the vehicle, and has to allow the accidents to happen. And because machine learning is not only inefficient, and you have to do it a thousands of times in a lot of cases, but you also have the issue where it has very selective recall. It doesn't infer well. So you, a lot of times you have to learn very specific scenarios because you can't assume because you learn one scenario that it's going to, that it's going to figure out another one. So you would, we're going to have um, literally um, these safety drivers losing their lives uh, in order for these, these accident scenarios to be trained. And once the general public figures out uh, that that's occurring, there's no way it's, it, it, you know, there, people are gonna be permitted to go further, especially after the first child or family's killed. And I'm, I'm curious, maybe uh, I'm, I'm a layman in this particular area, but how is the algorithms, as I understand it, they're only as good as the data that's input by a human. So how how are you able to account for all of these potential possibilities, these outliers in the long tail, uh, to to create uh, something that's resembling a real world test? Yep. Yeah. Excellent question. So the issue comes down to uh, um, uh, efficiency, time, and money, uh, and, and which in which environment do you do you have the capability of actually accomplishing what you need to accomplish? So with the real world, clearly it's real. The problem is again that you cannot uh, avail yourself of enough time, nor can you spend the money to get through it. So let's say you have a long tail. Uh, take any long tail you want. The one Elon Musk used was some tractor, a tractor trailer tractor towing other tractors. And he said that was a long tail, fine. Let's say that's a long tail. How many lifetimes will it take me now to find the variations of that long tail by stumbling on them? Meaning the, the trucks are different colors, there's a different quantity of trucks, the lighting is different, the weather's different, there's other objects. You will never in many, 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 many lifetimes get through those variations. And then even if you could, you can't repeat them all, repeat them one time, let alone the thousands of times necessary. So now you have the real world, it's just not possible to get through the majority of, of the scenarios you need to get through if you don't have the time or money. Now look at simulation. So assuming simulation has the proper fidelity, which is a problem right now in the industry because they're using gaming architectures or they're using OEM-based systems that are basically vehicle simulation uh, systems, not what is necessary here, but setting that aside for now. Um, what you have to get to is a provable level of, of sigma or, or, or factor better than a human. So you don't need everything, you need enough. So we believe that if you have the right simulation with the right scenarios, the right data collection with the right experts, and believe me, this is a massive effort. So I don't, I don't wanna make like somehow this is easy. But again, there's a difference between doable and not doable uh, or impossible and possible. So uh, again, we believe that the way to do this is simulation. And, and, and keep in mind, we want real world data. We are all for shadow driving when the human's under control. Uh, because we get data and, and there's other data sources, the detailed mapping people, insurance data, there's a plethora of data out there. So we believe again, that if you have the right team with the right cross domain experts, um, you can create enough scenarios with enough data so that you can prove that you reach some uh, quality level uh, to test these vehicles. At, at what point, Michael, did you determine that it was time to speak out about the autonomous vehicle issue? It, was there a, a one particular watershed moment, or did it just kind of gradually happen over time? Yes. Yeah, so, so three years ago, uh, I saw this. I, you know, I came out of aerospace and defense, and then because you know Lockheed terminated me because <laughs> of the whistleblowing, uh, I went to IT, and I know what how the, that world works relative to best practices, which there really aren't any. Uh, and there's not a lot of system engineering. There's not a lot of what if scenario engineering or, or or exception handling engineering. So when I saw what was going on and saw the public shadow and safety driving, I knew right away that it it made no sense. Again, from a time, money, and safety point of view, it was just crazy. And because this is a perfect storm, you have layers of 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 uh, of, of a lack of understanding. It's not that these people in, in Silicon Valley and the people making autonomous vehicles aren't intelligent. Clearly, they are. Um, the issue is you generally don't have experience in things you're not exposed to. And if you don't have the exposure, you don't know what you don't know. So the majority of these folks come from and Twitter and 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 like companies and they just don't have the domain experience from a system engineering point of view 
or, or, or even a vehicle or sensor point of view, they're spinning up on everything at the same time. So, and they also, simulation is a problem. The simulators they're using are, are gaming architecture based, which we can go into why that's a problem, or they're using systems that were made for the OEMs to build a car, and those systems are problematic here as well. So now they're sitting there and they don't, you know, the simulation's not gonna work for them because they look at the simulation and they go, well, that's not, that's not gonna be good enough, so now I have to use the real world. And now you can see they're, they all, they're all realizing it because they're moving their timelines from this year to, you know, Chris Ermson now, now saying, um, he went to 30 years and I believe he's at 50 now. So um, they're, they're figuring it out, but they, they, you know, they're stuck because it's a massive echo chamber and generally people don't defy those echo chambers for reasons of, you know, Maslow's triangle, food, shelter, clothing, and you can put ego in there. So they're all just, you know, they, they people get kind of stuck uh, when, when there's kind of a group think problem like this. So I saw it and thought, well, given my background um, in simulation and system engineering, but also because I did this whistleblowing thing that people can verify, my thought was, well, maybe I have enough engineering and ethical credibility to where maybe I could get involved in the industry. And, and at first, I actually didn't even want to create a company because clearly there's a conflict of interest here, right? So it comes down to, well, you know, that's interesting. You're the only person who seems to know what all the problems are. And then miraculously, you're selling the only system that you think can fix it. So, so I get that it's a conflict of interest. And I tried to avoid it by working with the simulation companies in the industry. Um, but they either were the gaming IT folks who think Silicon Valley innovates everything or, and didn't want to talk to me, or they did. And we, and we showed them where they had issues and they didn't want to fix it because they realized that they would have to admit they were wrong. They would have to create a second, completely different system um, so they told me that they will fix it when their customers realize there's a problem and pay them to do so. And that answer was unacceptable to me because figuring this out that it's wrong will probably be because of real world tragedies. I decided to create a company and reach out to aerospace and defense and solve it on my own. And you had mentioned uh, offline when we were just talking about the um, Grand Theft Auto being used as a model for the for the, this uh, simulation testing. I mean, how, how does that work? So what, what are the flaws in using a gaming engine technology? Yeah, actually, uh, so M-City, University of Michigan, works with the American Center for Mobility, uh, ACM, up in, up in uh, uh, Michigan. And when they did some of their studies uh, on simulation systems, they used Grand Theft Auto. Um, and, and, and actually, in, in defense of Take-Two, who makes Grand Theft Auto, they came out a little while after that and said, please don't use our system for this. Um, so the problems with, with gaming architectures are, first, let me explain, their visual rendering engines are fantastic. So the issue is not when they create visuals, the quality of their visuals, okay? Uh, the issue is their core engine uh, or executive behind that. Um, more often than not, they're non-deterministic, which means they're asynchronous, uh, or even when they're synchronous, um, they run all of their models at one time as opposed to have the ability to, to, to separate them. So let me go to the aerospace and defense side and explain what they did and why. Uh, so hopefully it'll make more sense. Back in the late 80s and 90s, when they started doing this technology that eventually gaming uh, licensed, uh, back then computers were obviously much worse than they are today. So the only way that they could um, meet the real-time requirements, which for aircraft, the FAA has this incredible detailed test set called the Part 60. And in there, they delineate how much latency you can have. So for aircraft, I believe it's 120 milliseconds of extra latency um, to the visual system. For vehicles, ground vehicles, it's 16 milliseconds because they, they have faster lateral motion. But back then at 100 milliseconds, they decided, well, the only way to move data around fast enough was to use memory. So they had massive shared or global memory. But then they also needed to create a deterministic architecture. And what that means is you create a clock and you determine when every single process runs, the order it runs in, and how often things run. And because of that, they were, they, they were able to create their technology. The gaming folks decided not to do that, and they use a non-deterministic architecture. And again, even when they use one as deterministic, uh, it's, it's, it's at a macro level. They, 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 don't, they just run everything all the time, and whenever it gets done, it gets done. Uh, I was actually at an event in Detroit where I was speaking, and so was a gentleman um, who works for Unity, uh, you know, one of the two large gaming engine uh, manufacturers. And after I explained what I, I just explained to you, 
uh, and we had talked about it ahead of time, uh, he came out and said that what I, what I was saying was actually correct. So the gaming engine systems can have value, right? Or, or the OEM based systems that, are, that can have some value. The problem is, is that if their real time is off or their model fidelity, which is a completely separate issue, if that is off, what will happen is um, if you're running a simple scenario or benign scenario where you where the models, your generic models or what you think are specific models are all good enough and the timing's okay, you can be successful. But as soon as you have a complex scenario or you push the performance curve of any of those models, uh, you will have an issue where the planning system will think it has a capability in the real world that it won't have. So say, for example, I have a vehicle model and I need to do a performance maneuver um, that that model is not capable of doing or the real-time nature of the system won't let me do it. The planning system won't know that that is off. So it'll create a plan. And when that real vehicle gets to the real world and is in an analogous scenario, it will have a timing issue or it will have a, um, an issue where it doesn't apply enough braking or acceleration or it doesn't turn the wheel hard enough. And again, or the timing's off. And that difference in performance will be enough to either cause an accident or make an accident be worse than it, than it needs to be. And, and the limited amount of testing that has been conducted so far with, uh, you know, quote unquote, autonomous vehicles, obviously there's no level five yet out there that's fully uh, operational, but how many, how many fatalities have we seen? Has it been half a dozen or so? Yeah, five in a te five confirmed in a Tesla and and one in an Uber, uh, and uh, I, the reason Tesla has so many uh, more uh, is for several reasons. One is they have a lot more cars out there. Two, uh, they don't use lidar, and which is a mistake. And they um, also now because Elon has said they're going to have level four this year, they're also far more aggressive than anyone else. So their their geofence. And geofencing is largely hype, uh, which we can talk about. But basically, now he needs to learn learn, learn the United States. <laughs> so um, they are just trying to do everything now at one time. Uh, so I would expect that 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 um, Tesla continues to have the most amount of accidents and probably winds up being the ones who have the first child or or, or family fatality. As a matter of fact, Tesla was just and Tesla Autopilot was involved in an accident two weeks ago, I believe, in Russia where once again, a Tesla and autopilot hits a stopped object. It hit a tow truck. They've hit fire trucks before uh, that are sitting in the middle, of the, sitting in the road. Um, but he, uh, he hit a uh, tow truck and he broke, I believe he broke his legs and, and, and his nose. And now though, his, his children were injured, uh, not, not, not gravely, but they, they had some bruises. Uh, but this was the first time that children were involved in a autonomous vehicle in development, level two or level three or whatever you want to call it. And how does LIDAR work? Yeah, so it, it shoots light. It shoots a, a laser at a certain frequency, and it bounces back, and they measure the time between when they send it comes back. It's not unlike radar from that point of view, um, but it uses uh, a laser as opposed to uh, uh, other radio waves. And it creates a 3D point cloud that can be used for not only localization, um, but also um, object detection. And one other thing, too, that seems problematic to me is that you know, Tesla even uses the term autopilot, which, you know, again, I mean, it's, it, it doesn't absolve them from, from any kind of blame. But, you know, if, if you, you know, people think uh, autopilot, I assume something will drive itself or take, it, you know, take over and be responsible for whatever it needs to be responsible for. So hey, I, have they had any backlash just for using that term? Yes, as a matter of fact, uh, the country of Germany asked them to not use it. Um, the, Ralph Nader's on them now. Uh, I believe Sully uh, Sullenberger is on them about that. Um, the FT, uh, several uh, consumer groups have, FDS, F, F, have asked the FTC to look into it, which they are, uh, basically from the standpoint of, uh, of, of, of uh, fraudulent advertising. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's giving people a, um, a massive... Um, uh, misperception of the capabilities. But I see, here's the thing though, I think that's on purpose, which is the reason why uh, Elon won't, uh, the, the time that they have on their steering wheel detection for seeing it, for making sure the driver's not distracted is 24 seconds. That's ridiculous. It's a ridiculous amount of time. Um, but the reason why he's doing that, I believe, is because he knows that he cannot have his drivers disengage because if they disengage, they won't get the data on the thread and especially for accident scenarios. So he needs those folks, whether they, whether they volunteer or not, 
to allow those cars to experience those scenarios so that they can get the data. And then they have to do that over and over and over and over again. So I believe he um, uses the term autopilot and does what he does to inspire false confidence, which is why in his videos, right, the legal language for Tesla will say, you have to have your hands to the wheel at all times. Go look at the 60 Minutes interview or, 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 or most of his YouTube videos, and he's, he's letting go of the wheel the entire time. As a matter of fact, when they did their big demo, uh, live demo on YouTube of two months back or whatever, the demo that they had, uh, that they showed at the time, the driver didn't touch the wheel one time. That's incredible. Michael, are there any others out there who are sounding the alarm about this issue? Or are you the only one? Uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I guess uh, I'm the loudest in talking about the most things, um, but there are a couple. Uh, Missy Cummings, who's head of robotics at the University of Duke, she's an ex-fighter pilot. She um, has, has issues with the whole handover uh, thing. Uh, Sully Sullenberger is starting to speak up a little bit. Um, there are... Um, the industry itself is starting to migrate because when, when Elaine Herzberg was killed, uh, uh, right, uh, in, in Arizona, in the Uber, after that, things came to a little bit of a halt, and now people started mentioning more simulation. Uh, and now I think they're misleading people there because simulation is being used more, but again, it's not adequate simulation, and they're really, they're really barely using it. You have to use simulation for 99.9% .9 of the development and testing, not of the quantity of scenarios, but of the development and testing. And nobody's even remotely close to doing that. And you can tell because I don't know of a single autonomous vehicle making company that is either one using the right simulation or two has a full motion simulator. And you have to have a full motion driver in the loop simulator um, because whether you're doing imitation learning or you're doing reinforcement learning, there are those scenarios where you have to have a human involved and they have to get, they have to feel motion cues on their inner ear or body. Because if you don't get those cues, you will not drive or evaluate properly. Uh, and it, an example of that is driving in snow, loss of traction. You can't drive in snow without feeling uh, motion. And uh, there's other scenarios too, acceleration, high acceleration and braking, uh, um, uh, driving in somewhere where there's a, a steep grade and actually bumping things. There are times where you get hit or you hit someone else and you don't know it unless you feel it, or you could drive over something and not, and not be aware of it unless you feel it. So. It's very, very clear that while these people say they're using more simulation, they're not using remotely enough, and it's not the right simulation. You, you mentioned the handover issue, and I, we've interviewed several people on this program about distracted driving, and one of the topics that always comes up is, you know, what's, what somebody thinks, oh, it's no problem, I just looked at my phone for three seconds, but they don't realize how long it might take for your full situational awareness to, to kick in again when you put the phone away and you take a look at your environment and continue to drive on. And on your website, you had mentioned that uh, there have been several studies you cited where it, it could take a driver anywhere from three to 45 seconds to regain that full situational awareness. So, you know, it, it's amazing to me that that hasn't been talked about a lot either in, in the public because you're, you're seeing models models like Tesla where they're they're in uh, autopilot mode and then somebody has to take over manually again and and there's that little gap where you know it could be a, up to 45 seconds where someone really isn't fully engaged with the process of driving which is incredibly dangerous right absolutely uh, universities of Leeds and Southampton did studies to show that range of time and that's that is scenario based right and, and scenarios could be a succession or progression of scenarios um, but, but I give you an excellent example of how people's uh, situation awareness is degraded. And it all, it all is tied to steering. You, you can have braking or acceleration handled for you, but as soon as you let go of the steering wheel or you don't have to pay as much attention. So there was a study done uh, on um, level one lane keeping. And the study was on are people lo losing incremental situ situational awareness? And they found that they were. And the way they were able to tell is, is people who were driving with a car with lane keeping would take longer to signal and make a lane change manually than they would if they didn't have lane keeping. And the reason for that was people were using losing a small amount of situational awareness because they knew they had the lane keeping to back them up. So even though they were looking forward, right, you could, you're daydreaming, you're thinking, you're doing whatever you're doing. So they found that people in those cars had to readjust themselves for another second or what, two seconds or whatever it was more than the person who didn't have lane keeping so that they could reacclimate and then put on that blinker and make the lane change. 
Michael, how long do you think it will take to get to, I guess, level five, this full automation concept, if they try to go down the path that they're doing right now, or do you think they won't even get there? So level five is no steering wheel and you can drive it everywhere. And I, and I think that would include, for example, you know, places like India or Vietnam. And I don't know if you've ever seen those places, but how they interweave vehicles. <laughs> so take level five off of it. And this is, let's say, level four. So level four being most places you don't, you don't, need, a, you don't need a human driving. The answer, and I know there's a lot of hype in this industry, but using public shadow and safety driving, the answer is never. And, 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 and let me double down on that. You could literally take every autonomous vehicle maker in existence right now. They could come to an agreement to all work together and share all their vehicles and all their engineering, and they will still not come remotely close. And again, it's because of the time and the money thing. When I did my estimation of $300 billion, I assumed, so that's a trillion miles, for example, I assumed um, 10 years. To do that, I, I looked at, let's say it's 50 miles an hour on average, which is too fast, but I'm trying to be conservative here. At 50 miles an hour, that's 234,000 cars driven 24 by 7 for 10 years. Even if the trillion is 500 billion, okay, fine. We have 110,000 cars or whatever, whatever the 110, okay, 110,000 cars. Right now, I believe I saw a report that said there's 1,400 cars in the road amongst all of the autonomous vehicle makers. So even if they were to try to do it, which is impossible, they'd have, they'd have to have hundreds of thousands of cars driven 24 by 7 to even attempt it. So it's, it's just not remotely possible to, uh, to do it. And again, once they get to those accident scenarios, it doesn't matter how many cars they have. When the public realizes the, the level to which they are guinea pigs, this whole thing will stop. Now, Michael, you, you've been involved in FAA simulation technology. I've heard some commercial airline pilots say yeah, the planes pr practically fly themselves. How, how true is that? Yeah, it's, it's so... Um, they don't have systems that allow the pilot to get distracted like this because they don't use autonomy in those situations. Uh, take the military out of it to some degree. Um, but autopilot in a plane um, generally is in scenarios where the pilot would, would, would almost always have the ability to regain situational awareness. They're not taking off, having to do all the flying and landing, and the pilot is just like kind of paying attention. Um, the, the FAA does do, though, that it's been doing for decades is – uh, it knows simulation how important it is. I don't know if you saw the movie Sully, but in the movie Sully, at the end, there's a simulator, and it's it's incredibly important in the movie. And that's a level D simulator. Uh, FAA has levels of simulation fidelity, one through seven, and A through D, D being the top. And they have this massive test set. It's huge. It's called the Part 60, and it and it has tests so that you can validate that the model fidelity of the various models uh, and the real time activity. Uh, of the simulator is close enough to the aircraft so that the, the simulator can be trusted. In a level D aircraft, the majority of the airline pilots, I believe it's over 95% of their training is done in the simulator, not in the actual aircraft. Wow. So, so is your company Dactyl, are you working on, uh, what level, what, what stage are you in? Are you doing R&D work? Or are you working in partnership with other companies? Uh, kind of help us understand how that fits into uh, to your work on autonomous vehicles. Yeah, so I'm a startup, uh, and uh, my partners are Minova Technologies, who's an aerospace and defense firm out of uh, in Orlando. Uh, they're doing all the simulation for me and helping me with the scenario matrix tool. Um, and Ansible Motion is a full motion simulator, uh, driving the loop simulator company out of the UK. But they also have a presence in the United States, so they're partners of mine. Uh, we're, we have a demo, and we have that demo because Nova Technologies donated their time to create the demo. Um, but we're currently out there uh, trying to get beyond that. Uh, you know, it's an uphill climb uh, for a couple of reasons. One, we have to tell people that their approach uh, or the analogy being their baby is not attractive, right? So you have to tell people that not only is the public shadow and safety driving uh, approach wrong, but your simulation is not adequate. And it's not easy to go into a situation uh, and tell your customer that, that pretty much what they're doing has issues. And then there's also my advocation. I realize that I'm very, I'm very out there, I'm very direct. Uh, and the reason for that is because history tells us that echo chambers are not broken because somebody says, please. Uh, more often than not, it takes tragedies and I would prefer that not to happen. I mean, the FAA exists because of tragedies in the 50s. Um, so um, uh, it's, it's, again, it's an uphill climb. Uh, but but we're, um, we're very mission focused and, you know, people are already contacting me. I've had three demos now with OEMs. I uh, can't go into who they are, obviously, but 
Um, one of them is still going on. The pop talks are very, very good. Uh, the, the two previous ones rejected us because, not because uh, we were wrong or our message wasn't right. It's because the message was right and we were correct. What's happening is either the stack or autonomous vehicle folks or the simulation folks, when you come in and you say, hey, you're going to have to tell your management that your approach was wrong. There's not a lot of people who volunteer to do that. And so what we're, we're finding is, is, you know, it's creating a, a situation where, you know, people become defensive because we actually can do the things we want to do. But people contact me from several companies. Uh, there are uh, autonomous vehicle and simulation engineers that agree with me. I can see I think things changing. Uh, I just have to hope that we can change it enough before, again, we have to react to tragedy. And like I said, I think the first child or family loss will be, uh, be what does that. Michael, do you, do you see any signs of a course correction coming? I, you know, what at what point do you think it's going to reach critical mass? Whether there's enough of a public outcry or government intervention, you know, how how far will that go? Or do you think uh, you see some signs where there there is uh, you know some some acknowledgement that hey, we were we were way ahead of ourselves in dreaming up this uh, this environment where everybody's just going to be sitting back and playing with their phones and working on their laptops where their cars take them from from A to B. Yeah, so this is a massive, the echo, well, I keep saying echo chamber, but it's, it's, a, it's a massive group thing. It might be the largest in history. I mean, I think this is the, the biggest example of, 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 of engineering or, or extremely smart people doing, doing something this incredibly wrong since Columbus. And I realize the Columbus analogy is, is uh, uh, kind of a myth, but j just to make the point. Um, what you have here is this massive leverage trust. The public thinks that Silicon Valley can do anything. Um, and so they figure this is in their wheelhouse. Then you have these people hyping and making like they've already done it or are doing it. That makes it worse. And then, and this includes the press, it includes the public, it includes the government. I mean, an example of the government helping to cause this problem. Uh, under Mark Rosekind, who's now the safety officer director at Zooks, uh, in 2015, uh, NHTSA did a study to see if you could make handover or level two and three safe. And they commissioned, um, uh, the Texas, um, uh, Virginia Tech to assist them. So the problem was, is that their whole methodology was extremely flawed. The way that they uh, did the testing was to have a person uh, texting or doing something where they were distracted. And then when they would uh, hit an alarm, they would hit the stopwatch. And then as soon as they grabbed the steering wheel and faced forward, they would now stop the stopwatch and determine that they've taken control. So because that was done in under two seconds, they said, well, look, we can do this. Well, and it, they never looked at situational awareness. And, and inside the document, there's a sentence where it says, we chose not to look at, at situational awareness. So they never looked at how much time it would take a person to regain enough situational awareness to do the right thing in various scenarios. So you just have this mess of kind of, well, a lot of arrogance and ignorance going on and, 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 and hype, and it, you know, and it all snowballs into, into what we're seeing now. So I think, unfortunately, it will take tragedy and for, and for the public to realize the degree to which they are guinea pigs. Um, an example of, of the NTSB actually figuring it out and doing something about it. There was a school shuttle, an elementary school shuttle uh, down in Babcock Ranch, Florida. And uh, it was you know, like everyone else, it was an autonomous vehicle in development. And NTSB came in and stopped it and basically said, look, we're not gonna have elementary school children be guinea pigs in, in this school shuttle. My problem with that is, is okay, that's great, but w those children are getting out of that shuttle and going in a Tesla or going in a Waymo or going in an Uber or wherever they're going. And, and so why aren't we protecting those children then? So, uh, yeah, so again, it's all gonna come around to probably um, uh, first death of a child or a family or a mass accident or whatever. Michael, we're approaching our allotted time. What's uh, next for you on the horizon as you're continuing to get the word out and raise the red flag about the uh, autonomous vehicle? So, you know, if you look back three years again before I tried to I tried to help the existing simulation companies. So I'm very mission focused. Uh, the reason I mentioned the whole whistleblowing thing is because it's then somebody can look and Google on me and see that I had done something um, that, you know, where it was large and complex and important. And I did my homework. Um, I'm more mission focused than I am. I'll tell you that I'm necessarily dactyl focused, meaning I want people doing this the right way because I'd actually like to see this technology come to be because right now people are doing the exact opposite of what they say they want to do because you're using shadow and, 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 and safety driving. You will never reach L4 or level four. And because you won't create a legitimate autonomous vehicle, you won't save the lives that would save. 
and you're taking lives and going to take many, many more in a fruitless pr pursuit to do that. So it's exactly the opposite. So I, I would like to help um, get everybody on the right path, whether actually they, they um, work with DACTA or not. Um, but I can tell you that there's nobody out there providing any piece of this correctly. Right now, people are throwing simulation or sc scenario tools over the wall, and a lot of those simulation tools don't have the right precision or model fidelity. Uh, and then you have to go and integrate all that yourself, and you have to go find all the data. So we actually want to provide every single bit of that, all of the simulation, the simulator, all the scenarios, all the data you need at the right fidelity. And we will provide proof that the models have the right fidelity where nobody else is, is doing that because obviously they don't want to be found out that it's not. Um, and yes, but right now that is that, that, those are the things that I'm doing. Michael, how could people uh, find out uh, more about what you're doing, contact you, or just kind of keep up with, uh, with your progress in this industry? So I'm on LinkedIn, um, uh, DAC, both, both as, as Michael DeCourt, uh, there is a Dactyl page. I have a website for Dactyl. Um, uh, I, I, do a lot of, <laughs> I do a lot of Medium articles and then I post them on LinkedIn and I'm on Twitter. So uh, finding, if you can't find me or connect with me, then you need a social, you need a course in, you know, how, how to handle social sites. <laughs> Well, you, I do appreciate your mission. Uh, safety is an important one. Uh, with that in mind, any uh, final uh, message you'd like to give the audience before we go? Uh, well, it is, please, I realize the odds of, you know, like when I started this out, I was the only person saying this. What are the odds that one person is correct? And all of these people are wrong, including Elon Musk. So I am completely aware of how this looks. Uh, all I would ask you to do is just try for a second to disassociate yourself from the odds and again, think about accident scenarios. If, if, if the way of learning accident scenarios is to experience them, think about what that means and just run that through in your head. And then you will see that the entire thing is an extremely naked king. Well, Michael, I appreciate your time today. Thanks so much. Uh, it's educational, informational, and it's super important because if uh, what you're saying is true, uh, I certainly don't want to be a guinea pig. So uh, I appreciate you having the courage to, to speak out and we need more people like you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you. Once again, that was Michael DeCourt, founder of Dactyl, a company devoted to the safe, ethical, and efficient development and verification of autonomous vehicles and unmanned aerial vehicles using aerospace, Department of Defense, and FAA simulation technology. Please share this podcast with your family, friends, and coworkers, and help us educate the public about the autonomous vehicle industry. Innovation can be a marvelous thing but we must do it with the public safety as priority number one. Until next time, please drive safely. You've been listening to the Driving Safety Show. To stay up to date on the latest episodes, visit driversalert.com forward slash driving hyphen safety hyphen podcast. There you can sign up for episode notifications, listen to past episodes, and even request to be a guest on the show. And don't forget, the Driving Safety Show is the show that features the movers and shakers who are working hard to make our roads safer. See you next time.